like coming, coming to Mecca, coming to the center of uh, really the um, translation of basic science into therapies for developmental brain disorders. So it's, uh, it, really, it really had a great day and um, really enjoyed hearing about what was going on today at lunch from the graduate students and postdocs. Very bright group. Um, so <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, Tom Ensel, who is the director of the NIMH, was visiting MIT. And um, he made the points that I show on this slide. So I sort of stole this from Tom. And they make statements that I suppose should be obvious, but he felt it was worth emphasizing. And so I thought it would be worth emphasizing as well. You know, Tom's job is to, uh, to unravel the mystery of psychiatric disorders and develop uh, treatments for them. And uh, the points that he wanted to make were that first, that psychiatric disorders are brain disorders. So there's an organic basis for mental illness, and that is the brain. And if we're going to ever understand mental illnesses, we need to understand how the brain functions differently in them. <coughs> Second point was that uh, almost without exception, psychiatric disorders are developmental brain disorders. That is to say, you know, diseases like schizophrenia or even mood disorders like bipolar or major depression uh, arise from alterations in brain wiring and function during development. And that if we only understood how the brain developed differently in these diseases, we might be able to intervene early enough to prevent them from being expressed. So at the Mind Institute, you're not only studying uh, autism, you're studying essentially all psychiatric diseases, trying to understand how the brain develops differently. And the third point that he made was that it's clear that the causes of these disorders are genetic under the influence of experience, but really to emphasize the genetic roots of many of the psychiatric uh, disorders. And the fact that a psychiatric disease has a genetic basis is not reason for fear. It's a reason for optimism. Because understanding how the brain functions differently under the influence of a genetic mutation gives us the opportunity for potentially devising a treatment for that disorder. So it's this focus on uh, the genes that is really defines the, um, the era of molecular medicine. So we live in the post-genomic era. And the hope is, is that um, we can begin with a human psychiatric disease um, that is well phenotyped. Uh, patients are well phenotyped. They uh, appear different. They appear similarly. And therefore, we surmise they may have a common cause of the disorder. Um, the effort is put in to discover the genes that either confer risk or protection for that disorder. And based on this information, we can create uh, what Tom Insel likes to call model animals, to distinguish them from animal models, which is to say these are animals that are genetically engineered to carry the mutations that confer risk or cause the disease in humans. With these genetically validated models, we can then uh, hopefully understand how the brain functions differently in these diseases. And I should point out that the brain, the manifestation of different brain function in a mouse may be different than in a human. So a human may manifest as autism, and a mouse may manifest as something completely differently. But still, the fundamental pathophysiology, that is, how synapses or circuits are functioning differently in these two species may be exactly the same. Now, to go from the disease model to understanding pathophysiology requires uh, sort of a healthy dose of basic neurobiology, that is to say, exploiting the understanding of uh, how brains function that we've been working on for many years to understand how they function differently in the context of a disease. Now, if we're lucky, um, disease pathophysiology may suggest therapeutic targets. That is to say, usually a therapeutic target is lingo for saying a protein in the brain that if we could introduce a molecule that could interfere with the function of that protein or sometimes augment the function of that protein, 
we might be able to correct the path of the altered physiology. If we're fortunate enough to have identified a target, we can uh, develop uh, molecules using chemistry to um, optimize them for the proper characteristics that they can get into the brain and last for a long time. And this may lead to the introduction of novel therapeutics that can fundamentally correct these diseases. So as you know, the track record so far in accomplishing this is extremely dismal in psychiatric diseases. And the reason for this, well, there, there are probably many more reasons than I can think of on the top of my head, but I can think of three of them. Uh, one is the um, complexity of psychiatric diseases and the imprecision with diagnosing them. Um, so in other words, we talk about schizophrenia as if it's one disorder, but it might be many. Uh, and if it's many, there may be many all, uh, underlying causes. So there's a lot of complexity and it's difficult to stratify patients in psychiatric diseases. Secondly, the brain is very complicated. Um, so it's not surprising, I guess, that uh, we haven't had much progress. And the third is, is that the genetics are very complicated. The one thing that we've really learned so far in psychiatry is, is that this complex genetics. Many genes have been discovered that confer risk, um, but very few genes have been discovered that are a smoking gun that are easily modeled in animals. So having said this, um, it's not to say that we aren't on the threshold of a, of a tremendous success, we, we hope. And that is in uh, Fragile X syndrome or Fragile X mental retardation. And um, the advantage that we have in Fragile X, the very important advantage in Fragile X is that it's a single gene disorder. And so the history is, is that um, some years ago, uh, astute, careful clinicians um, identified a population of patients uh, that appeared to um, exhibit the same a common syndrome which at that time was called Martin Bell syndrome. Um, some years later, the gene that causes the disorder was discovered. So in 1991, a group led by Steve Warren and Ben Ustra and Dave Nelson uh, discovered that uh, Fragile X was caused by the silencing of a gene called FMR1 that encodes a protein called FMRP. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, Ben Ustra's group uh, introduced uh, the first genetic model of the disease, the Fragile X knockout mouse or FMR1 knockout mouse. And subsequently, many other genetic organisms have been employed as well, such as a, a fly that doesn't express the fly homolog of FMRP and also a zebrafish model of the disease. So we have good model animals of the disease. Um, so in sort of um, unintended consequences of basic research, we discovered that uh, one function that's mediated by a neurotransmitter receptor in the brain called MGLUR5 was apparently exaggerated in the absence of the FMRP protein. And since there was too much activity at MGLUR5, it suggested that this could be a therapeutic target. Um, and the uh, proof of concept was provided by a number of different studies, but one uh, was the genetic reduction in MGLUR5 in mice, in the Fragile X mice, could correct multiple phenotypes. So we could essentially correct most of the major structural and behavioral phenotypes that we could measure by reducing the expression of the MGLUR5 receptor. So that validates this as a therapeutic target. And fortunately, um, there was a lot of effort and tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, were spent on developing small molecules that target this receptor. And these small molecules are now in clinical trials in Fragile X. So we're, this is an auspicious moment. You know, we really stand at the threshold, possibly, of, of um, making good or fulfilling the promise of molecular medicine. So um, what I thought I'd do today is to um, tell you a little bit, a brief history of how, how we got to this point. Uh, from my perspective, um, what, what's going on now and what are the challenges that we're facing right now in Fragile X, and then uh, broaden the lens a little bit to consider um, autism. So how do we get here? Um, well, my story is um, that uh, it, it was an accident that we got here, and the, the accident came from uh, the study of 
basic neural development processes. And the process that uh, we've been studying for a long time is the process by which connections are formed and modified in the visual part of the brain, in the visual cortex of the brain. So this slide illustrates the um, basic wiring diagram of the peripheral visual system, which begins in the eyes with projections of retinal ganglion cells centrally. There's a relay in the, the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, and then these neurons give rise to axons that go up and travel up to primary visual cortex. And what this slide shows is that there is a segregation of input from the two eyes at the level of this first relay in the thalamus, uh, and this information is only combined at the level of primary visual cortex. So it's the convergence of precisely mapped points on the two retinas onto single cortical neurons that gives rise to binocular vision. This is why we see one world with two eyes. And it occurred to, um, actually this was first discovered by the pioneers, neurobiological pioneers Hubel and Weasel, and it occurred to them that this level of precision was unlikely to be achieved strictly by genetic instructions alone. And they surmised that there might be an important role of visual experience in fine-tuning these connections. And they did a, an experiment that is extremely simple uh, with yielding results that are extremely robust. And the simple experiment was that they uh, deprived one eye of normal vision. And you can do this any number of ways. Uh, you can close the eyelid. You can put a patch on the eye. You can even do, put an overcorrecting contact lens in the eye. You can even put eye drops in the eye that cause dilation of the pupil and blurring of the image. And all of these manipulations have the same effect in visual cortex. And the effect is, is that by denying this eye high quality image formation, vision, there is an immediate uh, weakening of the connections that uh, bring information in from this deprived eye in the cortex. And with time, there's a compensatory strengthening of connections from the other eye. So measured behaviorally, we would say the animal, in this case, the animal, goes blind in the eye that was deprived of normal vision. In a human, this is a very common human clinical condition called amblyopia. It affects about 1% of Americans. It's a, it's a visual disturbance that is caused by miswiring in the cortex due to uh, poor quality vision during infancy and early childhood. So um, the major interest of my lab for many years has been to try to understand the synaptic basis of this type of uh, modification. And the synapses in question use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. So glutamate's a simple amino acid. It's a dietary amino acid. And it's used by 80% of the synapses in the brain. So it's the, the major neurotransmitter in the brain. And certainly, it's the major excitatory neurotransmitter. So uh, when nerve impulses come up from the thalamus, they trigger the release of glutamate from the presynaptic bouton. This glutamate dif diffuses across the narrow cleft to activate glutamate receptors in the postsynaptic side. And these cause excitation of the target neuron. So this is the basis of synaptic excitation in the brain. Um, and since we have a mixed audience, let me give you a little primer on uh, glutamate neurotransmission. You could argue that the most important glutamate receptor uh, is this one called an AMPA receptor, shown here in the blue. Uh, the AMPA receptor is a glutamate-gated ion channel. So when glutamate binds to the channel, the channel opens, positively charged ions flow into the postsynaptic neuron and cause synaptic excitation. That is the workhorse of excitatory synaptic transmission. If you block AMPA receptors with a drug, you will silence the brain because okay, it completely prevent uh, transmission across these excitatory synapses. But there are other glutamate receptors that play um, ancillary but very important roles, and their role appears to be to modify the strength of AMPA receptor-mediated transmission. And these two other receptors are the NMDA receptor, which is also a glutamate-gated ion channel but has the unusual property that the ion that passes is calcium that can modify AMPA-mediated transmission. And this other receptor that we're going to hear a lot about is the metabotropic glutamate receptor. That's a, not an ion channel. It's a G-protein coupled receptor, which means that when glutamate binds here, it activates a biochemical pathway that can alter the function of other proteins in the postsynaptic 
neuron, including the amphoreceptor. So, um, when we first started thinking about this problem of, of visual plasticity and, and why you go blind when you're de deprived of normal vision during early life, we thought that perhaps um, the synaptic depression that occurs in the cortex might be mediated by this metabotropic glutamate receptor. And we didn't have a very firm foundation. This was pretty much a wild speculation, to be honest. Um, but there was some evidence already at that time, and this is back to the late 80s, that synaptic strengthening could be triggered by NMDA receptors. So we thought, okay, NMDA receptors are there to strengthen synapses, and maybe metabotropic glutamate receptors are there to weaken synapses, and that synaptic strength is maintained in some way by a push-pull uh, between these two neurotransmitter receptor types. So that was the idea. And to test this idea, we had to develop a preparation that we could really do a mechanistic studies of synaptic depression. And uh, the preparation that we developed, um, actually originally not in the visual cortex, but another part of the brain, the hippocampus, uh, is illustrated here. And essentially, what we were able to do is to electrically activate synapses in specific patterns and we could trigger synaptic weakening. And that's a phenomenon called homosynaptic long-term depression, or LTD. And this was first described in 1992. That was my first graduate student, Serena Dudek. And uh, this is an example of her, uh, one of her experiments. So this is synaptic strength on this axis versus time. And we sh can shock these axons periodically to evoke synaptic transmission and plot those data on a graph like this. So this is the baseline showing stable synaptic transmission. And then at this time, marked by this uh, bar here that says LFS, Serena just turned up the stimulation and uh, frequency to one hertz, one per second, for 15 minutes, and then resumed the test stimulation. And what she found was is that the stimulated synapses were weakened. And so this is a now famous uh, form of synaptic plasticity called LTD, or long-term depression. Now, although we were really wanted to test the hypothesis that this LTD was tr triggered by MGLU-Rs, metabotropic glutamate receptors, we really didn't, uh, we really weren't able to, to test that idea for some years. And it really wasn't until Kim Huber joined my lab as a postdoc uh, that we cr found a reliable way to trigger LTD in a way that required MGLU-R activation. So we, of course, were very happy about that uh, because this, essentially, we thought well, we were right, that MGLU-Rs can trigger LTD. But of course, we now understand that there are many mechanisms of LTD. That's important to stress. So in fact, this one is triggered by NMDA receptor activation, which was a surprise. But nonetheless, by 2000, we had established a reliable um, preparation in which we could study MGLU-R-dependent synaptic depression. So you can certainly ask the question, the valid question, what took us so long? Uh, a lot of time elapsed here. And the answer, it's, well, we would say it wasn't our fault. And it wasn't our fault because when we began, we knew very little about MGLU-Rs, and we had no drugs, no tools to study them. So uh, in the intervening years, in, in, the, in the 1990s, it was discovered that uh, there are multiple metabotropic glutamate receptor genes. There are eight different MGLU-Rs. Uh, these fall into three functionally related categories or groups, group one, two, and three. Uh, and when I talk about MGLU-Rs, I'm always talking about group one MGLU-Rs, and there are two members of that group, <coughs> MGLU-R5 and MGLU-R1. And these are the ones of interest to me because these are located postsynaptically at these cortical synapses that we're very interested in. And in addition to the advances in molecular biology, there are also advances in pharmacology. So we have some tools uh, such as a drug that will selectively activate group 1 MGLU-Rs called DHPG. And I'll be talking about experiments using DHPG. And also a drug that selectively inhibits MGLU-R5 called MPEP, M-P-E-P -E or MPEP. So finally, we had these tools. And uh, this enabled Kim to uh, develop this preparation to study LTD. And so here's an example of uh, some of her experiments. So it's the same sort of setup. 
We have the strength of synaptic transmission on the y-axis versus time in the experiment. In this particular experiment, Kim is recording intracellularly from a neuron in the CA1 region of hippocampus and stimulating synaptic transmission with an electrical pulse applied to those axons. And she can collect a baseline and then to activate the NGLUARs in this experiment, she's applied DHPG, that's the selective agonist that activates group 1 NGLUARs. And when she applies DHPG for five minutes, you can see that synaptic transmission is depressed. And if you just look at the green symbols, it comes back, but it stabilizes uh, at about, oh, 40 percent uh, less than the baseline value. So that's MGLU-R LTD. It's triggered by activating MGLU-Rs. But Kim made the additional discovery, and, and turns out to be extremely important discovery, that this form of LTD required immediate translation of messenger RNA at the synapse. That is to say, it required protein synthesis. And that's demonstrated in this experiment where, in interleaved experiments, she filled that neuron with a compound that interferes with the translation of messenger RNA. It's a, it's a so-called CAP analog that will compete with endogenous mRNA for translation initiation. And in the experiments, in the cells in which she blocked translation, mRNA translation, you can see that the LTD comes creeping back to the baseline. So there is a component of this LTD response that requires protein synthesis. Now, we went on to study this in a lot of detail. We still don't know a lot, but we, we, we know some things. Um, and the, the first thing I want to stress is that this LTD response requires translation of pre-existing messenger RNA at synapses. So it doesn't require gene expression. The mRNAs are already at the synapse, and I know this because we can cut away the cell bodies and still trigger LTD. So it requires translation but not transcription. So translation of pre-existing mRNA at synapses. Secondly, we can get the same phenomenon if we study cultured hippocampal neurons. It gives us a lot more experimental access. And when we do that, what we've discovered is, is that when you activate MGLUR5, there is the immediate loss of AMPA receptors from the surface of neurons. So a loss of AMPA receptors from the synapse. So that is one of the important mechanisms by which this LTD is expressed. Synaptic depression occurs because you remove the AMPA receptors from the synapse. But if we, if we block protein synthesis with a protein synthesis inhibitor, these AMPA receptors appear to cycle back to the membrane. So we can trigger an immediate depression of synaptic transmission, but it re rapidly recovers if we block protein synthesis. If we allow protein synthesis to occur, something's happening in the cell that stabilizes this change. Perhaps these AMPA receptors are shuttled into a new compartment or degraded, but for some reason, there is a stabilization of the LTD response. So this now thrust us into waters that were pretty deep for us uh, and begged a lot of questions, such as, uh, what's the signaling pathway that couples in GOR5 to protein synthesis? And how is protein synthesis regulated? And perhaps most importantly, what are the proteins that, whose translation is required to stabilize this form of synaptic plasticity? And this is where our work bumped into Fragile X. Um, and it did so because uh, back in the 90s, uh, Bill Greeno, working at the University of Illinois, provided data that one protein that is synthesized in response to MGLUR activation is this protein called FMRP. So some years earlier, Bill had shown that activating MGLUR stimulates protein synthesis. And then in 1997, he and Ivan G. Weiler found that one of the proteins that was synthesized is the fragile X mental retardation protein. So we were aware of FMRP. In fact, we probably knew more about FMRP than we knew about Fragile X syndrome. Uh, and the obvious question from our point of view was, is FMRP one of these hypothetical LTD proteins? Is this a protein that must be translated to stabilize LTD? So basic science question. And so we 
got from Steve Warren the Fragile X knockout mouse. So we got the mouse model of the disease that lacks this FMRP protein. And so if you're following me, uh, what we predicted was that in the Fragile X knockout mouse, when we did our LTD experiment, we would see an impairment. We would see less LTD because there was less of this LTD protein. That's what we predicted. But when we broke the code on our experimenter blind experiments, well, we were delighted to find that there was a difference, but we were shocked to find it was in the opposite direction of what we expected. And so this is the LT, in the open symbols is the LTD response in the wild type, the normal controls, and in the filled yellow symbols is the LTD in the, in the Fragile X knockout mouse. So there was exaggerated LTD, and um, this got us thinking about, maybe, well, maybe we were thinking about FMRP incorrectly, and the model that we eventually um, arrived at is shown here, and that is that perhaps FMRP is a negative regulator of protein synthesis at the synapse, and so you activate MGLUR5, you get a burst of mRNA translation of LTD proteins, and in addition, FMRP, but FMRP feeds back to suppress further mRNA translation. So the, this is a classic negative feedback loop. It's very common in, in uh, biochemical synthetic pathways. It's an example of what's called end product inhibition. So you activate protein synthesis. When proteins are synthesized, they shut down their, their further synthesis. So that was the models and consistent with our data. So you take away FMRP, you get too much protein synthesis and too much LTD. And this was consistent with in vitro data that were already available, some test tube data uh, from a number of investigators, including Steve Warren, that FMRP, an RNA binding protein, might be a repressor of protein synthesis. Well, so our interest, as you can see, was in this form of synaptic plasticity, LTD. but um, I was aware that MGLUR receptors in the brain do more than trigger LTD. Uh, and some of the lasting consequences of activating MGLUR receptors are listed on this slide. And it doesn't really matter what they are, but there are, there are multiple consequences of activating MGLURs. And um, many of these consequences have been shown to be protein synthesis dependent. So in fact, the very first demonstration of that is this line right here, prolongation of epileptiform bursts. This was discovered by Bob Wong uh, in New York, who showed that MGLUR activation can generate epileptiform activity, uh, but that that response requires protein synthesis. So it's very much like the LTD thing that I'm telling you about. So it got me thinking that maybe um, it, there is a general increase in the consequences of activating MGLUR receptors in the absence of FMRP. So I started making a, a list, actually started scribbling a list of what would I expect Fragile X syndrome to look like based on this one very simple idea, that there was too much protein synthesis downstream of MGLUR5. And, you know, as the list started to develop, I started getting pretty excited about it because it looked like we might have a thread that could connect widely different symptoms of Fragile X ranging from cognitive impairment to anxiety to altered gastrointestinal function to epilepsy. Uh, so it seemed like we had one thread that could connect these uh, different symptoms of the disease. And it was an exciting idea, mainly because if it was correct, um, perhaps we could ameliorate aspects of Fragile X by inhibiting the MGLUR5 receptor. So, um, we had the idea, we were eager to test it, but um, we felt that it was important to share the idea even when it was half-baked or not even a quarter-baked, um, just because the implications were, were very important. And so uh, in, in 2002, I went to a meeting at the Banbury Conference Center in Cold Spring Harbor, and I presented the idea that's called, now it's called the Imgluar Theory of Fragile X which states boldly that the psychiatric and neurological aspects of Fragile X syndrome are a consequence of exaggerated responses 
to group one in gluar activation. And it's called a theory because it's, it's based on an assumption. And the assumption is, is that excessive ingluar dependent protein synthesis is pathogenic in Fragile X. And uh, it has a consequence. And the consequence is, is that downregulation of ingluar 5 or ingluar 1 and 5 and restoration of normal protein synthesis should correct aspects of Fragile X syndrome. So this assumption that there is too much protein synthesis in uh, the brains of Fragile X, uh, or the brains lacking FMRP, um, was, has been validated in a number of ways. But I think one of the most striking validations was provided by Carolyn Smith, who is, uh, works in the intramural program at NIMH. And Carolyn is an expert in studying cerebral metabolism. And she studied the rate of basal protein synthesis in the brains of the Fragile X knockout mouse. And her data are reproduced here. So just to orient you, this is a, a nissl stain of the hippocampus of these mice, um, showing the location of cell bodies. And then what's shown in these colorful panels in the middle are um, autoradiographic representations of the incorporation of a radioactive precursor into protein. So in other words, these mice were fed a radioactive precursor to protein, radioactive amino acid, that was incorporated into protein. And she could measure under steady state condi conditions the rate of that incorporation, because there's a measure of protein synthesis. And so here's the protein synthesis in the wild type. Here's the protein synthesis in the knockout. You can see there's a lot more hot colors here, reflecting an increase in protein synthesis. And quantification of her data is shown here, showing about a 20% increase in the protein synthesis in the Fragile X knockout mice in different regions of the hippocampus, labeled CA1, 2, and 3. So the Fragile X mouse has a higher basal rate of protein synthesis. And this is a very robust finding. In fact, it's so robust that we can take the hippocampus out of the mouse and keep it alive in vitro for many hours and do the same experiment that Carolyn did uh, and measure this increase in protein synthesis. So it's not increased because of some fancy network property that's altered in the brain of Fragile X. It's intrinsically increased. So uh, this is an experiment done in my lab by Emily Osterweil, uh, who, by the way, is a fantastic postdoc and is entering the job market. I think you should <laughs> snatch her up. She'd be a fantastic addition to my institute. Uh, but, uh, so what Emily is showing here is the uh, incorporation of radioactive amino acid into proteins. Wild types in the black bar, the fragile X knockouts in the red bar. So she's been able to reproduce the phenotype that Carolyn Smith um, demonstrated. We can also run these proteins out on gels and look at well, what molecular weights the radioactivity is being incorporated into. And what it looks like is that it's being, this increased protein synthesis is not confined to one or a few proteins, but it's a rather general increase in protein synthesis of many different proteins, probably hundreds. So this preparation uh, offers the opportunity to test the hypothesis that this excessive protein synthesis is downstream of the ingluR5 receptor. And so to, to look at that, Emily used this drug I told you about called MPEP, which is an ingluR5 antagonist. And so she could just put MPEP onto the slice and measure protein synthesis. And what she discovered was is that this treatment was sufficient to completely correct the excessive protein synthesis in the Fragile X uh, slices. And interestingly, it had no effect on slices from the wild type. So this meant that the excessive protein synthesis is somehow downstream of constitutive activation of ingluR5 receptor. And uh, Emily has a very nice paper that's just about to appear in Journal of Neuroscience, and I'll let you read the details. But uh, the, the model supported by her data is that ingluR5 signals via a MAP kinase called ERK uh, that leads to synthesis uh, of LTD or proteins uh, that are excessively translated in Fragile X. So in the absence of FMRP, the loss of this negative regulation leads to excessive protein synthesis. And interestingly, I should point out that not only can we correct that with MPEP, we can also correct that with drugs that inhibit ERK. Uh, 
So this is a potentially an interesting therapeutic target. But it's a story for another day. Um, so, so just to summarize then uh, our view of what's, what's wrong in Fragile X or pathogenic in Fragile X is that uh, we have a, a molecular machine in the brain uh, by which uh, pr synaptic proteins are synthesized uh, to keep up with demand. And demand is registered by amount of MGLUR5 activation. So uh, MGLUR5 stimulation triggers synaptic protein synthesis, but like any good machine, there's a negative regulators uh, to keep the system within balance. One of these is the FMRP. Uh, in the absence of FMRP, there's excessive protein synthesis that's downstream of constitutive activation of MGLUR5. So we, we describe this in words as leaky protein synthesis or leaky translation in response to basal MGLUR5 activity at synapses. So, <clears throat> so MGLUR5 activation of mRNA translation is amplified in the absence of FMRP. And there are multiple functional consequences of MGLUR stimulated protein synthesis. So this leads us to the next the real prediction here, which is that perhaps we can correct psychiatric and neurological aspects of Fragile X by reducing signaling through MGLUR5. That really is the, the heart of the MGLUR5 theory. And so there are a lot of ways one might go about testing this idea. <clears throat> but we felt that the most definitive test uh, would be what's called a genetic rescue experiment. Um, and the logic goes like this. Uh, in a normal mouse, uh, we have balanced uh, protein synthesis, uh, or regulated protein synthesis, by this balance of MGLUR stimulation and negative regulation by FMRP. <clears throat> in the Fragile X knockout, we take away the FMRP, we get exaggerated protein synthesis. And the question is, if we reduced the amount of MGLUR5 protein expressed in the brain by crossing an MGLUR5 heterozygous mouse with a Fragile X knockout mouse, could we correct protein synthesis uh, and, the, uh, and other mutant phenotypes? So that was the logic. It's a genetic, classic genetic rescue experiment. So I'm going to describe uh, data that were obtained in mice from four different genotypes, wild type which is the normal controls, knockout, which are the Fragile X model animals, MGLUR5 heterozygotes, these are animals where half the, the, we've silenced half of the MGLUR5 genes so that there's a 50% reduction in MGLUR5 protein, and the cross between the MGLUR5 heterozygote and the Fragile X knockouts. Okay, so those are the four genotypes. And the first thing we want to look at is the rate of protein synthesis. So this is protein synthesis on the y-axis. Wild type, knockout, showing the elevation. There is no effect uh, of reducing MGLUR5 expression by half. So this is a fairly benign manipulation in the wild type background. But it's sufficient to completely correct the excess in the knockout. OK, so just like the acute drug treatment, this genetic manipulation could restore the normal level of protein synthesis in the Fragile X animals. So now, with this uh, genetic cross, we are able to look at a large number of different phenotypes. That the idea was to interrogate as many aspects of brain development and function as we, we could. Um, and so the phenotypes that we examined are listed here. Again, I don't think the details much matter, but the point is, is that we are interrogating many different circuits uh, in the brain. And um, if I was asked to describe the Fragile X phenotype with an arrow. Uh, it would be an upward arrow for all of these phenotypes, which means to say that they're exaggerated. So I already showed you the example of long-term depression, LTD. Uh, this is exaggerated in a knockout. I showed you the example of basal rate of protein synthesis. This is exaggerated in a knockout. And some of these other phenotypes that we looked at, for example, audiogenic seizures, seizure susceptibility is increased in a knockout. Um, the MGLUR5 pets, in contrast, have uh, essentially no effect. There's no effect on any of the things that we measured, with the one interesting uh, exception of the ocular dominance plasticity, which we're following up on. But the important question is, what happens when we cross? And the answer is, is that we are able to correct um, seven of eight of the mutant phenotypes that we studied 
the only exception being macroorganism, that is to say post-adolescent enlargement of the testes, which we couldn't correct with this manipulation, uh, which is not to say MGORs are not involved. It's just that we were unable to correct it with this 50% reduction in MGOR5 signaling. So um, I'll just give you one example, I think, of a very striking um, rescue of Fragile X, and that is increased spine density. Um, so <clears throat> uh, dendritic spines are the structures on, on the dendrites of neurons that receive excitatory synaptic input. And in general, there, the number of dendritic spines is thought to reflect the number of synapses, and the structure uh, is thought to reflect the, the function of those synapses. And um, it had been known for quite some time that in Fragile X, there is an excess in the density of dendritic spines uh, many neurons in the brain. And um, so the neurons that we examined were those in uh, the superficial layers of the visual cortex. And we looked at both the so-called apical dendrites and the basal dendrites. And the, the, what you do in these experiments is you measure the density of spines along the length of dendrite. So here's a length of dendrite. This is the stain to reveal these spines. And here's an example from wild type and knockout. And hopefully you can see that there's an increased density of dendritic spines. And we can quantify these data in a graph like this one, which shows the spine density as a function of distance along the dendrite. There is a function that, that controls that. But here's the, here's the wild type value. So spine density is a function of distance. And then this is shifted up by about 20% in the fragile X animal. So there's about a 20% increase in the density of dendritic spines in the fragile X animals. The MGLR5 um, heterozygotes are indistinguishable from the wild type. So that's the het. You can't even see the curve because it falls right on the wild type value. And if we do the cross, what you see is really a dramatic result, which is that it completely corrects the excess spine density in the knockouts. So this simple manipulation was able to rescue this structural phenotype in Fragile X. And it's a true rescue because it's not two um, uh, opposite phenotypes canceling. There was no effect of the MGLUR5 uh, reduction alone, but it was enough to completely correct the excess in the Fragile X. So from these results, what we can conclude is MGLUR5 is a valid therapeutic target in Fragile X. Um, and of course, I've highlighted the work in my lab for the obvious reasons that I'm drawing attention to my own work, but uh, I should point out that there are a lot of labs all around the world set out to test this idea. And uh, most of them used pharmacological approaches, and they used this drug called MPEP. And uh, a number of papers have now published using MPEP, looking at a lot of different uh, measures of brain function. And actually, the first one was done by Rob Bauquitz, who showed that injecting MPEP into mice could correct the seizure phenotype uh, and some other behavioral phenotypes. But you can see from just reading the titles of these papers, a lot of different functions have been looked at. Uh, epilepsy, protein synthesis, uh, structural changes. Um, and amazingly, this is not true just for the mouse model. This is also true for a fruit fly model. So in the, in the fruit fly model of Fragile X, you can feed those animals MPEP and again correct structural and behavioral defects. Uh, and if that isn't enough, there's also a zebrafish model of Fragile X and you can put uh, MPEP in the water uh, and that also corrects uh, structural uh, defects in the development of the zebrafish brain. So this is an important point to stress because this appears to be an evolutionarily conserved relationship between the fMRP and the MGLUR signaling. So just to give you an example of um, results obtained with MPEP, I will show you one example from audiogenic seizure. This is a, a very robust phenotype in the Fragile X mice. Uh, if you play a loud tone uh, to the mice, they will um, have a very stereotyped response that ultimately leads to status epilepticus and death in the fragile X mice, uh, whereas the wild type mice in, the, in this genetic background do not have seizures. And um, to give you an example of the 
the effect of MPEP. This is work from Rob Balquitz again. Um, these are all fragile X knockout mice that model the disease. Um, in a second, a tone's gonna come on. These animals on the left were injected just with a vehicle solution, no active drug. And the animals on the right were injected with MPEP 30 minutes before the experiment. You can see the tones come on. You can see these mice are racing around. This is the early stages uh, and they're having seizures. These animals are completely corrected, uh, sorry, protected um, from the effect of this tone, even though they can still hear normally as measured other ways. So there's great therapeutic potential for uh, blocking MGR5 receptors. So just to recap a little bit what I've told you is I, I, I'm arguing that there is a molecular machine in the brain uh, to ensure that protein, the supply of synaptic proteins keeps up with demand. And demand is registered in the brain by the release of glutamate and signaling through metabotropic glutamate receptors. So the more active MGLURs are, the more protein is synthesized. A very important negative regulator is fMRP. And that normal proper brain function requires a fine balance of protein synthesis. Uh, so what I imagine is, is that we can have a plot of synaptic function or brain function, cognition, versus synaptic protein synthesis that has a bell-shaped curve so that uh, there's an essential level of synaptic protein synthesis to maintain normal synaptic function, but it's possible to have too much of a good thing where it's actually toxic, and that is the situation in Fragile X. So in Fragile X, the loss of this negative regulator leads to excessive protein synthesis and impaired synaptic function, but we can correct this uh, in a number of ways, including blocking MGLUR5 to dial back protein synthesis and bring this back into a normal range. So what's been exciting about this story is even though it's actually not very old, um, there's already now been, uh, there are already now human clinical trials using MGLUR5 antagonists underway. Um, we know that, there, I, I should say that I founded a company to pursue this before Big Pharma became interested uh, called Seaside Therapeutics that licensed in from Merck and go R5 antagonists and they're going into phase two this year in the United States. Uh, Novartis has completed a phase two trial in Europe and is now, I'm told, going into phase three and Roche has a phase two trial underway in the United States right now. And in addition, other approaches uh, less direct, but approaches to suppress the release of glutamate in the brain are being undertaken by Seaside. So we're really at this point where we have novel candidate therapeutics uh, going. So, so all the hard work's been done now, and you, you people just have to do this part. Okay, so so that's, a, <laughs> that's a terrible joke because uh, now, now it's time for the hard work. And this is really where um, the people at the Mayan Institute are, are actively engaged and playing in a vitally important role. Um, and, you know, I prepared this slide for another audience, and I, but I, I probably left some things off. But just think about the challenges that we confront now. We say we have this promising potential therapeutic. Um, how are we going to design trials to prove whether it works? And so some of the obvious considerations that have to be taken into account, when, when must we begin treatment? I mean, I think common sense would say as early as possible. But that's not necessarily possible, um, for example, in a drug like an MGLUR5 antagonist that has never been approved for use in humans. In any other indication, it's unlikely that it will be approved, um, at least not immediately, for use in children. Uh, what's the right dose? Um, how long do we have to treat before we see an effect? Consider antidepressants. It takes many weeks before you see any therapeutic effect. We don't know how long we have to treat. Uh, what, what do we measure? This is something I had some great conversations today about what is the right thing to measure to, to see if there's a beneficial effect? And as importantly, how do we measure it? What are the, what are, what are the instruments by which we can measure these things that will have reliable, uh, reliability both you know, within a certain clinical site but also across sites? And we can imagine what the possible outcomes might be. So if we, uh, what I've tried to represent here is um, the maturation of different functional domains in the brain as a function of age. And this might be a normal curve, and in Fragile X, there's an impairment with accumulated deficit. And if we start treatment at any age postnatally, what, what can we hope for? Well, the most pessimistic scenario is shown at the bottom, which is that 
if we started treatment too late, we would have no effect, which isn't to say we couldn't have an effect, but we started it too late. So we missed a critical period where treatment must be begun. Um, the most optimistic scenario is the middle one here, where even though we started treatment after we've started to see um, the symptoms of the disease, this treatment can actually correct the trajectory of brain development. Uh, and maybe the more realistic outlook would be that we could prevent further decline uh, by starting treatment late. But these are the questions that we don't have answers to. And some of these questions can be addressed in the preclinical animal models and, and, and must be. And so I just made a quick list of things that I consider to be urgent preclinical uh, questions. For example, uh, can mutant phenotypes be reversed by late onset treatment? And there's, there is some optimism that they might be because uh, really first in a study in the Rett syndrome mouse model, but now more recently in the Fragile X, it's been shown that in the mouse, if the gene is re-expressed uh, during adolescence or just after adolescence, many of the functions appear to recover, particularly structural changes in the brain. So it's possible, but we don't really know. We don't really know in the case of MGLR5 treatments. Um, if we assume that excessive protein synthesis is pathogenic, what are other targets? You know, MGLR5 uh, drugs may, may fail for a lot of mundane reasons, like uh, you don't get, obvious, uh, don't get enough exposure to the brain, or maybe they have side effects that can't be tolerated. So we have to identify other targets, like other receptors that stimulate protein synthesis, the signaling enzymes, and the pathogenic proteins. And finally, uh, you know, I'm very fond of the MGLUR theory, but um, I would be amazed if that was the end of the story. Uh, so clearly, uh, I think we're going to, we certainly in the animals, we've gotten some dramatic effects. But what phenotypes are not explained by exaggerated MGLUR function or exaggerated protein synthesis? And how might we creatively target those? For example, by manipulating inhibition in the brain might be an example. Um, so these are the challenges that we face, we basic uh, scientists face right now, and a lot of work is underway right now. So if you indulge me for another five, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, so the story I told you um, had the following history. We began with amblyopia and ocular dominance plasticity that led to creation of a model for LTD that led to an interest in metabotropic glutamate receptors that led to the MGLUR theory of Fragile X, that led us into Fragile X. And so now we're beginning to think uh, that we're going to think about autism more generally. And the reason we think about autism is because the rate of autism in Fragile X is high. And this is work that Rondi has done and others showing that, uh, I mean, the numbers vary, but a very substantial fraction of children with Fragile X will satisfy the full diagnostic criteria for autism. But Fragile X is only one of several single gene disorders that share the autistic phenotype. And uh, some of these are highlighted here. So in addition to Fragile X, there's tuberous sclerosis, uh, P10 hamartoma syndrome, neurofibromatosis, Rett syndrome, and Angelman syndrome. And so these are single gene disorders, so-called syndromic, causing syndromic autism, or autism that's associated with these syndromes. Um, and it occurred to us, and by us I mean Ray Kelleher and myself, Ray is a colleague at MGH, that some of these genes could be easily fit into a signaling pathway at the synapse that regulates protein synthesis. And <clears throat> So just to complicate matters ever so slightly, uh, here is a extremely simplified cartoon of a signaling network uh, that has been implicated in the control of protein synthesis at synapses, which begins obviously with our favorite receptor, the metabotropic glutamate receptor, and it ends with translation of messenger RNA. And some of the members of, some of the uh, molecules involved in this coupling of MGLURs to protein synthesis are circled here. And these are the uh, molecules that are defective in these different single gene disorders associated with autism. So neurofibromatosis caused by loss of NF1 that is a negative -like regulator of RAS, which is thought to be important for triggering this pathway. P10, 
is a negative regulator of PI3 kinase signaling, which is, so P10 is a negative regulator of the signaling pathway. Uh, tuberous sclerosis is caused by the loss uh, or heterozygosity of either TSC1 or TSC2 genes. That is a negative regulator of the signaling pathway. And finally, FMRP is a negative regulator of protein synthesis. So, you know, the picture starts to emerge, come into relief, that maybe uh, many diseases uh, that are associated with autism have in common altered regulation of synaptic protein synthesis, and in particular, it looks like excessive protein synthesis. So this is a paper we published a few years ago where we laid out this argument that maybe there is a common pathogenic mechanism that manifests in humans as autism uh, that is related to altered regulation of protein synthesis at synapses. Um, and so it's an interesting idea, and it's got, uh, it's got um, big implications. And one of the implications is, is that a treatment developed for one of these disorders uh, may apply to others and maybe even uh, idiopathic autism, autism of un currently unknown cause. Uh, the other feature that this slide or point this slide tries to make is that not every uh, disorder associated with autism is likely to be due to excessive protein synthesis. And we actually fingered Rett syndrome as one that may be associated with diminished protein synthesis. So that was the idea. So uh, eventually I, I got a great graduate student to come to the lab to actually uh, test the idea. And we began with uh, tuberous sclerosis. <clears throat> and the reason we did was that um, there's a well-validated animal model of tuberous sclerosis. Uh, tuberous sclerosis has a lot of, I am told, phenotypic overlap with fragile X, which I've highlighted here, in addition to intellectual disability, ADD, autism, and epilepsy. And as I mentioned, um, there is this idea that tuberous sclerosis is caused by excessive protein synthesis downstream of this protein called mTOR. So it's a complicated slide, but the, this, the logic is, is that activating these cell surface receptors activates this protein called mTOR, and normally this is inhibited by this TSC1 or TSC2 proteins that are missing in tuberous sclerosis. So in the absence of these proteins, excessive mTOR activation and excessive protein synthesis. So it was a, seemed like a very simple, straightforward idea. Here's the hypothesis. TSC and Fragile X have shared synaptic pathophysiology. The prediction is that the, these mouse models will have similarities. Uh, and the test that we tried to use was what we're familiar with, which is the LTD and protein synthesis assays. So we wrote up a grant. This is about the time that the um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was implemented. So we wrote up a little grant called um, Comparative Synaptic Path of Pathobiology of tuberous sclerosis and fragile X syndrome. And it was not funded. And um, one of the reasons it wasn't funded, I just took the uh, part of the review out, was that it wasn't bold enough. I mean, that these were so close together, it was almost, we almost knew the answer without doing the experiment. Like, of course, there was going to be too much protein synthesis. So that's what made it so rewarding to me when we found that, in fact, they are exact, they appear to be the exact opposites of one another. So you remember that we got off on Fragile X because we saw excess protein synthesis in the Fragile X knockout. Here's the mouse model of tuberous sclerosis. And what Ben found was that there was impaired uh, LTD. So reduced rather than exaggerated LTD. So that's not a phenocopy. Moreover, Emily went on to measure protein synthesis. Here's the excess protein synthesis in Fragile X. Here's protein synthesis in, tuber in the tuberous sclerosis model. It's diminished protein synthesis in the tuberous sclerosis model. And this effect is specifically a consequence of excessive activity of this mTOR protein uh, because it is acutely corrected by applying a drug that inhibits mTOR. So in the, fill I just the filled symbols here, filled red symbols, are the TSC animals, and the open symbols are TSC animals treated with rapamycin. That's a blocker of mTOR. So we inhibit mTOR and we rescue LTD. We also rescue protein synthesis. 
So the model then that we uh, come up with to explain our data, it goes something like this. At the synapse, glutamate activates in glur 5 signaling through ERK to stimulate protein synthesis, including LTD proteins that will, are necessary to stabilize LTD from an early phase to a late stable state. This protein synthesis is negatively regulated by FMRP. So in Fragile X, just to belabor this one more time, we take away FMRP, increase protein synthesis, and the therapeutic targets to correct that are uh, drugs that reduce the release of glutamate, like r being developed by Seaside, drugs that block in glur 5 like the Novartis and Roche and glur 5 antagonists, and also drugs that inhibit uh, the ERK signaling. Some drugs are available for use in can cancer therapy to do that. So these are interesting therapeutic targets. Now how about TSC? In TSC, we take away this negative regulator of mTOR. In elevated mTOR activity actually suppresses protein synthesis, leading to reduced LTD. This elevated mTOR activity can be inhibited by rapamycin. That's a, a drug that directly inhibits mTOR activity. But we wondered whether we could potentially correct this reduced protein synthesis by using a, another, um, another tool in our bag of tricks, which is a drug that is a positive modulator of MGLUR5, a drug called CBPPB. It's an allosteric positive modulator of MGLUR5. So Ben tried CBPPB in his slice assay, and look at this. The diminished LTD in the TSC animals comes back in CBPP, in the MGLUR5 positive allosteric modulator treatment. And this is due specifically to the uh, rescue of this protein synthesis because it's blocked by a protein synthesis inhibitor. So it's great to do experiments because it modifies your theory. They modify your theory. So, you know, we were wrong. It looks like TSC should be slid over here. But more interestingly, it looks like TSC and Fragile X, at least in the way we've studied it, are, are mere symmetrical alterations of synaptic function. So whereas Fragile X is uh, associated with an excess in protein synthesis, an excess LTD, and can be corrected by a negative regulator in MGLUR5. TSC seems to be related to diminished protein synthesis, diminished LTD, but this can be corrected by augmenting MGLUR5. Now, this is really interesting if you think more broadly about autism and the challenges that we face with autism. As I said, TSC and Fragile X have overlapping phenotypes. Um, and Yet, they may be caused by uh, mere symmetrical opposite synaptic pathophysiology. So a treatment developed for Fragile X would not be appropriate for TSC, and nor would a treatment for TSC be appropriate for Fragile X. Um, and so what this means to us as we now consider autism is that we need to know how the brain's functioning differently to rationally choose a therapeutic approach. And we can do it empirically, uh, but we may run out of money before we get, get the answer. So it's going to be really important to understand where the individual is on the spectrum of synaptic function uh, to choose the right therapy. And so I just want to close by saying I, I, I want to propose this path to go from autism pathophysiology to treatment. I mean, the one thing that I've learned by studying Fragile X is that the genes are great, but what you really need to understand is how the brain functions differently in that genetic context, and that is to say pathophysiology. And I think that we have an opportunity in the single gene disorders, like Fragile X and TSC, to understand synaptic pathophysiology. So I think the roadmap is to study genetically engineered animal models of highly penetrant causes of ASD, to understand pathophysiology, and to discover targets. To, to test the idea that there are common pathogenic pathways um, in these animal models. Uh, and if you start to see that, then you start pulling in the genes that are related to these pathways, and you start to look in those genes for variants that may correlate with autism. That may give you this biomarker that we need to understand what would be the right therapy. 
And then based on that information to expand clinical trials like those going on in Fragile X to non-syndromic autism that are guided by these biomarkers. And with that, I just want to thank the people that funded me and thank you for your attention. You didn't review it, did you? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit of a paradoxical result with fibrous growth, uh, TSC, because the general product of the disease as growth promoting uh, or to prevent basically uh, overexpression or like tumor suppression. So um, yeah. the result is a little paradoxical. So how do you explain the paradox? Well, <clears throat> It is paradoxical, and obviously it was really unexpected. And um, so I don't, I don't have the answer, but there are a couple of, there are a couple of possibilities. Um, one, one actual simple possibility is that FMRP is um, phosphorylated by S6 kinase, which is an mTOR target. And so if you really wanted to connect Fragile X and TSC, you, you might imagine a model in which FMRP is hyperphosphorylated, and those proteins that are FMRP regulated are repressed. Translation is repressed, uh, which is to say that all the other mRNAs that are not FMRP targets are, are translated in abundance. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that I, stepping back a little bit, it's just imagining two pools of mRNA uh, that are competing for translation. And one may be tumor promoting um, that is normally repressed by the, um, the protein synthesis that's triggered by MGLUR5. And so, in the absence of MGLUR5, I think I got that right. But actually, I probably have a slide. But anyway, the idea of two competing pools in competition for the um, translation initiation. Does that make sense? Maybe. But, but, but yeah, right. Maybe. And, and uh, you know, the truth is we don't know. It was an extremely unexpected finding, but but you know, really intriguing. I should say that the TSC2 HEP mice that we use do not have um, tumors, so they're unlike. Kind of obviously to me Maybe is, is, the is, is the necessity to be, I, I would think you'd have to be really careful with your dosage. <laughs> when I'm looking at, at, at the two sides of, of the curve, um, and I, I'm wondering if you've gone far enough to, to see any effects um, of, of dosage, yeah. where you're sliding into the, to, to the, the symptoms on the other side of the curve? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, um, you know, all I can tell you is that in the animal studies, um, the MGLUR5 HET, uh, it looks pretty normal. So, in other words, you can tolerate this 50% loss of MGLUR5 expression. However, the MGLUR5 knockout is grossly impaired. So um, it's not to say MGLUR5 receptors are superfluous. They're absolutely critical for many brain functions, including proper cognition. Uh, in fact, it's also known that MGLUR5 antagonists can impair cognition in norm otherwise normal animals. Um, so, you, so you're absolutely right that, you know, by analogy, I would say, um, you know, who would treat someone with ADD with a stimulant? Well. It works because the ADD brain is different than a normal brain. So similarly, MGLUR5 antagonist, you say, who would treat a cognitive impairment with an MGLUR5 antagonist? Well, it seems to work in Fragile X because the Fragile X brain is different. But it's a, I think that this is a, a very useful way to conceptualize the challenge that we have uh, in picking dose. <laughs>
So I just want to put a plug into our Mind Behind the Minds talk next week. I think it's November 17th here in this auditorium where we'll be talking about these treatments in uh, patients with Fragile X syndrome. And we do see sometimes problems with too high of a dose and there, for many, there's a just right dose. More questions, yeah. You, you mentioned uh, before that one of the things you couldn't reverse was the gonadogenesis and the, in the, in the enlarged gonads in the animals. So I'm wondering if you think about the role of, say, for example, estrogen on protein expression and spine density, is that something that you've looked at in terms of, uh, you know? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question, and, and we haven't. <laughs> but it's a really good question. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, the reason that we even looked at the testes was that they actually express MGUR1 and MGUR5 at high levels. So um, it is possible that MGURs do contribute to that phenotype, but we don't know. It'd be amazing if it did. Yeah, because you can see uh, estradiol availability increases spine density and also is protective against uh, you know, cytotoxicity in the hippocampus. So it might be a, yeah. a pathway to look at availability of protein expression as well. Yeah, that's a really good idea. So it seems to me that uh, there is antagonistic relationship between dm 5 and AMPA and NMDA receptor. So I was wondering if is it known whether loss of function at these two, AMPA and NMDA, actually results in increased protein synthesis and whether by themselves loss of function at this receptor is associated with autistic spectrum disease. That's a good question. Um, and uh, so, well, first of all, let me just say that um, we are actually able to stimulate protein synthesis by inhibiting NMDA receptors. So, okay. right. So that would fit. So that, that does fit. But, but having said that, <laughs> I, I want to say that, uh, it, that I don't, I think it's overly simplified. Um, and uh, I'll just give you the example of AMPA receptor regulation. So, I showed you MGUR5 activation can trigger internalization of AMPA receptors, trigger LTD. But, and I've showed you that's protein synthesis dependent. But, but as I also said is that MGUR5 stimulated protein synthesis has a lot of different functions in addition to fragile X. Sorry. <laughs> I must be tired. It's jet lag. In, in, in addition to LTD. Um, and one of those is a phenomenon called LTP priming. So um, actually, um, in the same region of the hippocampus that we study LTD, uh, at a slightly different dose of DHPG, you promote long-term potentiation, and that's a protein synthesis-dependent effect. So I am very hesitant to um, sort of subscribe to the view that Fragile X is in any way a disease of excessive LTD. Uh, it may, I'm sure that Dysregulation of synaptic plasticity is is one of the one of the problems, but I think it's much better viewed as a d disease of excessive protein synthesis with myriad consequences. So, so correct. And I, it's it's relevant because people have tried ampokines, you know, drugs that promote amp receptor function to improve cognition in fragile X, and um, they may work. But I, I don't think that um, it's that simple. Thank you. More questions. How, I have one. How about uh, Yolanda de Diego's report about uh, rescuing the macroorganism with um, antioxidants, NAC, and vitamin E? I'd like to hear your thoughts about I, that. I don't have any thoughts about it. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Are you telling me we should try vitamin E in our LTD assay? Yeah. We, we could. <laughs> yeah. How about, how about sleep disturbances? Um, oh. Do you think those are independent of um, uh, mGluR5 antagonist rescue? I, do, I don't know. Um, I was, in the early days when I was getting excited about mGluR, mGluR theory, uh, one of the papers that I stumbled across was uh, one implicating mGluR5 in the regulation of circadian rhythm by, in the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, so, not so much in regulating it, but in coordinating it.
Um, and so I, th I thought that's actually when I learned that there were sleep disturbances in Fragile X when I was trying to connect that dot. Um, but we, as you know, Dave Nelson has looked at uh, some sleep. I, I do not know whether he's seen a rescue um, either in the genetic cross or with the drug treatment because that would be the, the way to go. Yeah, I thought there was one paper that said that it maybe didn't rescue, but maybe that was in the fly. Um, what do you think about crosstalk between glutamate and GABA systems and the GABA downregulation in Fragile X? I mean, is that completely independent or? Well, I think <coughs> the way I look at it is um, with Fragile X or any other disease process really is that there is a core uh, pathophysiological mechanism and then there are multiple consequences you know, secondary, tertiary, quaternary consequences. The reason I, I do believe that this relationship of MGLR5 and FMRP is at the core of Fragile X pathogenesis because of the fact that we can rescue in species from fly to, to mouse. So it's an evolutionarily conserved relationship, which would be unlikely if, it, if that wasn't at the core. Um, so, you know, having said that, Many things, you know, every year we read more and more papers about things that are different in, in the Fragile X brain. I don't think that's any surprise because the brain development has been gone awry. Um, so right now I don't know whether changes in inhibition are in any way at the heart of the pathogenesis, but they may be very important for the development of symptoms and so on and maybe therapeutic targets. That's kind of the way I look at it. I mean, a very simple way of look, looking at it also is that reduced, ex, reduced inhibition leads to excessive excitation, more glutamate release, and all the consequences of that. And so there's a logic behind treatments that, that increase inhibitory tone, um, both just at the network level of dampening down ex, excitatory activity in the brain, but even at the level of regulating glutamate release, which is what Art Baclofen is thought to do. Okay, I think we want to all give uh, Mark a thank you for his great lecture. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.